let's get started. Uh, this is 6004, lecture three. My name is Arvind. Today's topic is we'll be learning to express combinational circuits in a language called BlueSpec, uh, to be precise, BSV, BlueSpec system, Verilog. This course, course all throughout has sort of two tracks which are very tightly coupled. So on one hand, you have to learn about the basic stuff. So what is a combinational circuit? But then we also want you to really try it out. And we want to give you exercises and exams and labs. And for that, you can't do anything unless you learn blue spec. So that is the language in which we will express all the problems we want to solve, all the designs we want to do. So you have to understand both things. But the understanding of hardware precedes the understanding of blue spec. So if you don't know what a combinational circuit is, a blue spec is not going to help you understand what a combinational circuit is. So I hope you will follow this idea all through, because we'll be learning lots of new concepts from the point of view of logic design, from the point of view of computer architecture, programmable machines. And at every stage, you have to make sure you understand the concept before you try to express a design in a very specific language, blue spec in this case. All right. So. <clears throat> now, there is, uh, I need to do examples, right? Uh, otherwise, how will we talk about combinational circuits? So I'll take this opportunity also to establish a very deep connection that exists between Boolean algebra and binary arithmetic, right? So first thing is uh, numbers can be represented in binary, you know, using base two, and arithmetic can be performed on base two numbers as it can be done in base 10. Uh, <clears throat> systems, and you will have a full-blown lecture on this next time. So next lecture is devoted how to do binary arithmetic. In today's lecture, we're just going to take a few baby steps. I want to establish the connection between binary arithmetic and Boolean logic. So Boolean arithmetic has one-to-one -one correspondence with Boolean algebra. What I mean is that anything we do, right, any function we want to write, we can express as a function on Boolean, as a Boolean expression, as an operation on Boolean uh, values or Boolean system. So there is a very, very tight coupling between binary arithmetic and uh, Boolean algebra. So the thing that you have to remember is all arithmetic operations can be expressed as Boolean or as combinational circuits. And this is something that has not changed. I mean, this is how computers started for Neumann wrote a very important paper about this in 1946, I think, you know, saying why we should use binary representation. And it is just more efficient than doing it on uh, decimal notation. And furthermore, technology-wise, binary numbers really suit us very well, because as you will see, they mat perfectly with gates and Boolean algebra. <clears throat> OK, so encoding positive integers, uh, just like, you know, in uh, when you write any number in decimal base, you know, you are, there's an implicit weight that in the ith position is raised 10 raised to the power i, right? And you get the, what this number means is by summing up all those things. So value of n bit number uh, is given by the formula v equals uh, 2 to the i times bi, where bi is either 1 or 0. So it's very, very simple arithmetic, and you have to do it for all the bits. So for example, if I gave you this number, and I wanted to ask you, you know, because we are more used to thinking in decimal, what does this number mean? So you will say, well, you know, we can do it in a longhand way. So the highest bit is 0. So 0 times 2 to the 11. Next bit is 1. So it's 1 times 2 to the 10. Next bit is 1 again. So it's times 2 to the 9, etc. And I simplified it. I just took all those things which correspond to ones in this. And you can see these numbers. And voila, you sum it up, you get 2,000. Maybe some of you could already see that this binary number represented 2,000. So this process is exactly the same as you would have done in decimal arithmetic. Instead of looking at exponents of 10 to the i, you are looking at 2 to the i in this case. OK, so what is the smallest number I can represent? in such a system? Zero. Sorry? <laughs> because we are talking of integers here. So 
Well, this is zero in integer, okay. Uh, what is the largest number we can represent? Very good. So we can do two to the n because that's the, you know, we are, are zero-based system, so zero from two to the n minus one. All right, now let's see if we can do binary addition using uh, base two. So does everybody remember how to do addition in base 10? Very good. So if I add four and seven, I get one, and there is a carry of one. I'm not belaboring the point in case you forgot, right? So it's <laughs> and then <clears throat> you sum that thing to one and you get two. Good? We're going to do exactly the same thing with the binary representation. So if you add zero and one, what do you get? And carry of zero. Now when you add one and one, what do you get? Not two, right? That's outside the range. We only have zeros and ones. So you say, ah, it produces a zero and produces a carry of <clears throat> one. Okay? And now if I add, now I have three numbers to add, one, one, and one. Now what do I get? Fantastic, right? So we get some bit which is one and the carry bit of one. And now we can add one and one, so zero and a carry bit of one. So the final answer is one larger, right? So we get five bits here. Does the answer match? Who's fast in converting? Is one zero, one zero, one twenty-one? Probably, right? You can work it out. Good. <clears throat> so what I'm interested today is in actually building some hardware that can perform this operation. You all know how to do it, so you know the algorithm. The question is, what does it mean in terms of circuits? When I say, oh, here is a circuit that does addition. So that's what we want to understand, because our means are going to be Boolean logic, the gates that were introduced last time. Okay, so combinational logic for an adder. So look, we can go step by step. <clears throat> I can take a very small problem, I can build a half adder, which takes two bits and produces a sum bit and a carry bit. Yes? And then once we know how to build a half adder, we can build a full adder. And full adder will take two bits and a carry bit and produce a sum bit and a carry bit. And not surprisingly, you know, we can write the full adder using half adders in it. <clears throat> and now we have to build a full adders we have, and now how do I build the big one? A 32-bit adder or four-bit adder. And now you can cascade them like this. So you start out and on 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 this side, oh this is working? Okay. So Right, so here you see that you're feeding zero to it and you get C1 and this is being cascaded and is being fed to the next full adder, etc. So at the end of it you get a carry bit out and you have four sum bits, each being produced by one full adder in the state, in the system. Very good. Now suppose I wanted to describe a 32-bit adder. Well, you have many tools available to you. You can write a truth table, All right? So I give you a 32-bit number, another 32-bit number, and you can look at them and you can tell me what the answer is, you know? What is the sum bit, what is the carry bit? You think you can do that? Of course you can do that, right? If, if nothing else, you know, you go on the side, work it out. You know, you can generate this truth table. What is the problem? if I think in the, of a truth table. How big is it? 64 entries? Two to the 64 entries. That's a humongous number. So this is a non-starter, right? So yes, we can do a truth table, but no, we can't do a truth table. 
because it's just too big. It's absurd, right, to even think that we can do that. Well, I already kind of, I haven't shown you, but we could describe the Boolean equation at least for doing a full adder. Can't be that difficult, right? And if I could describe that, then for each full adder, I will have some set of equations and I can copy them 32 times, not so daunting. And you know, we can get fancy, you know, you may re remember your recurrences from uh, some course. You know, we can adopt some informal notation that k is going from zero to 31, and then this is the relationship, you know, between the kth uh, full adder and the k plus first full adder, et cetera. So instead of writing 32 sets of equations, I'm writing just one set of equations and relying that you know, common sense will work, you know what does it mean to plug k, different k values into this. Well, we could draw circuit diagrams. No, I mean, you know, four was fun, 32 will not be fun, right? So that's really just too tedious to even contemplate writing such complex diagrams because if you draw such diagrams, you'll invariably be using ellipses, right? You'll be using dot, dot, dot. So my hand is getting tired, I can't, draw so much. <clears throat> now, such representations are too verbose. I think this one in the middle is not so verbose. But there is something else which is extremely important in design. We always want to know what the hell have we designed? Have I actually built an adder? How do you test it? You put in some input values and then you see what came out of it. And if that was, this is the answer you were expecting, you feel happy. So we have dual purpose here. On one hand, we want a notation which describes these diagrams, how the gates are generated very precisely. But at the same time, we also want that these are not mere pictures. They, they are executable. If I say, oh, put the following values, then the following answer comes out. In that sense, they're like an ordinary program. So we want both these qualities you know, in our notation, and that's why we will use this language called blue spec system Verilog or BSV, or sometimes in this class we'll just call it blue spec, okay, to express all circuits. Please never forget that the purpose of blue spec is to design circuits. The fact that it also simulates and gives you answer, that's a bonus. Without that, it'll be very tedious. Otherwise, you'll always be building hardware and me measuring voltages and so on, not cool. Okay, so we want to be able to simulate the circuits we are designing before we actually fabricate them, before we actually build them. <clears throat> All right, so let's begin with half adder. Can you write down these equations? So truth table is very, very simple for half adder. We have two values A and B, and we are deciding in every case what is the sum bit and what is the carry bit. And if you remember how to go from the truth table to Boolean expressions, we are giving sum of product representation here, so you just look for one. So if I'm talking of sum, it has two ones in it, right? It has two ones. Oops, I have to change this because my thing is not very good. All right, so you have two ones in it. So how do I get this one? A has to be zero and B has to be one. So not A, B. You know, I'm not as clever with my notation as Professor Sanchez and Silvina, so I don't know how to draw over bar. It's too much work, so you know, just bear with me. So I'm gonna use this tilde to be negative, right? Okay, so, and, and you can see here that this one comes when A is one and B is zero, so it's A times not B. And if we remember our exclusive OR gates, then this is precisely what an exclusive OR gate was. So if you want, you can think of it as an optimization. If in no other things, at least you have to write less if you know about exclusive OR gates. You know? So this is, maybe it takes less area, less timing, faster, et cetera. That will come slowly as we have more experience with this. And carry, for carry, both bits have to be one. So everybody knows how to go from this truth table to these equations. But now where does BSV come into this? Where does blue spec come into this? So, <clears throat> oh yeah, so you, you know how to realize this circuit. You know, this is just exactly copying what is written in that Boolean equation over there. 
This notation, if you haven't seen it, represents a Boolean, uh, sorry, exclusive OR gate. <clears throat> OK, so now this is how I want to write it in blue spec. So I'm saying I'm trying to write a function called half adder, HA. It has two parameters, A and B. And S is A, that funny looking sign B. And C is A and B. And you return both C and S. So if you see, this is the blue spec encoding of the operator XOR. Right, so exclusive R is written this way in blue spec. And this is and operator in blue spec. You will write it like that. <clears throat> and what is C comma S? So C comma S is a concatenation. And before I go much further, this looks very easy to write, right? Almost trivial. It's actually not quite correct. So now I'm going to show you something which is also going to follow you all through the course. So you better get it right. And that is everything in blue spec is, blue spec is going to have a type. So to really make this program work, you will have to say that A is one bit wide. And this is how you write it. There's a type declaration. Bit number one, A, right, means that A is of size one bit. B is of size one bit. And how big is the answer? How big is the answer returned by the half adder program? Two bits, why? Because it's returning C and S. Each one of them is one bit, and this is a concatenation operation, so it returns two bits. How big is C dot S? I already gave you the answer. It's two bits. Yes. Half adder. You can give it any name you want. I could have called it foo. I think half adder is more expressive. All right. Good. <clears throat> so normal rules of programming languages apply here. You know, so there are names you can change, you know, and you will sub systematically substitute them. Scoping rules, everything will work. That, that you're familiar with in uh, normal programming. OK, so some more notes on BSV. Notice half adder is returning a two-bit quantity. So it's perfectly OK for you to write, oh yeah, first thing is I want to use from now on half adder as a black box. It incorporates deep intellectual property. I don't want to tell you what it is. Right, But that's it. From now on, we'll just use the box half adder. We don't care what is inside it, right? Because we define it once, we use it over and over and over again. So this is the first sign you're seeing of deep abstraction. All combinational circuits ultimately can be expressed as Boolean function. You know, you put in something and you will get some bit pattern out of it. <clears throat> now suppose I write T equals half adder of AB. So how big is T? Two bits, right? How do I know that? I declared it, right? When I wrote down my half adder, I said its type is, it returns two bits. Well, sometimes you want to pull T apart. You want to refer to the first bit or the second bit. So that's why you have these operators. So you can write T0. So when you write T0, you are get, getting the least significant bit out of T, which in this case will represent S. And then you're getting, by writing T1, you're getting the most significant bit out of it, which is, which represents carry for us. So notice that, that we can return T because the, the, uh, the type declaration for the function was that it returns two bits. And once it returns two bits, then I can select the first one and the second one from it. Okay, so now I can design my full adder. So what's happening in my picture full adder? So I have a full adder, I give it A and B, sorry, half adder, I give it A and B, so it'll produce a sum bit and a carry bit. And then I need another half adder to take this sum bit that came out and this carry bit came in, and then I, you know, this is my sum bit, and the carry out is when either of them is one, then you're gonna get a carry out from it. Yes? And now comes the next thing. 
any time you want to express a more complex operation in terms of simpler operation, just write a new function. So the new function I'm writing is, what does FA stand for? Fantastic, right? So full, but I could have called it FUBAS, right, or something. Anyway, so it has a one bit A quantity, one bit B argument, and one bit C argument, and it returns two bits, a sum bit, and a carry bit, so that's why it says bits two. And now you see what have I done. So I'm saying half adder of AB returns AB. This is so that I can remember what it does, so it's AB. But it's two bits wide. And now when I have to use the next half adder, what do you want from it? Which part of AB do you want? You want the sum bit from it, which is extracted by writing AB0, right? So this is, extracts the sum bit. So you are now feeding both of these to an, another half adder. It's uh, going to return another two bit quantity A, B, and C, which has a sum bit and a carry bit. And we know that the carry out is actually, you know, if you have either a, a carry bit coming out of A, B, or a carry bit coming out of A, B, C, then that's the C out bit. And what I'm returning here is the sum bit you know, that came out of A, B, C. You can see that it's the sec output from the second half adder over here. Now, the most important takeaway from this thing is half adder is being used as a black box. You don't have to know what half adder does, right? I don't go and look inside it. This you are extremely used to from programming, you know, in Python, any language in which you have programmed, it always has functions in it. Yes? Isn't the half adder returning the carry bit in the first index, and the sum bit the second? Yes. I mean, sum bit is. It's what recognizes. No, carry bit is uh, in the most significant part, and oh, you're talking of my picture. in the picture. So pictures are just suggestions. <laughs> you know, I, I, I should probably label it, you know, C and S, you know, very difficult to remember. Okay. Yep. Did it? Yeah. It shouldn't. Okay. Then it's a mistake. No? C and S. So, so would the sum be the zero index or what? Everything is zero index. Zero zero I'm, I'm, I'm lost here. Well, what is the confusion? Guys, I get confused very easily by these fence post errors. So don't confuse with zeros and ones. <laughs> okay. It's probably right, but if it was wrong, I wouldn't fall apart, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, extracts the sum bit, extracts the carry bit. Okay, it is being used as a black box. All right, <clears throat> so even in these two slides, some of you are grumbling, man, this bit stuff. Am I going to be writing bits which I have never written until now in my programming? So we're gonna make your life easier. Even though everything is gonna have bits and bit widths and so on, we make it easier. So you can write just let. Let AB equals half adder of A comma B. It's slightly more pleasant than writing bit two, right? So what is this let notation? No need to write down the type if the compiler can deduce it. Actually, you wouldn't know that whether the compiler can deduce it or not. You'll get very, very good at it, right? But the best way would be you feed it to the compiler. It says, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Then you say, oh, I meant this, right? So you can write lots of lets in your program, and if it can't 
disambiguate what type something had, it'll complain. The tool will complain. But can somebody tell me how will the compiler know that AB is two bits wide? But in this picture, we don't see it, right? Yep. Exactly. So in order to compile this, it needs not necessarily the body of half adder. It needs to know the signature of half adder. It needs to know that half adder accepts one bit quantities and returns two bits, right? So because it knows that, therefore it knows AB must be two bits wide. Okay, so that's why it's written. And now you can tell me how big is return C out comma AB zero. How big is the return quantity here? How big is C out? One bit and AB zero? One bit, right? Because you have extracted that bit, you know, from the two bit quantity you had over there. <clears throat> Okay, so now we are build, ready to build a two-bit ripple carry adder. We want to cascade these things. We want to take a full adder, connect it to another full adder. Picture-wise, all of you see it. Immediately, we can write down the signature of this function that it's gonna take x and y, which are two bits wide, right? And what does it return? a three bit quantity, a two bit sum quantity, and a carry bit is being returned. Okay, and now we're gonna use FA as a black box. So who's gonna string it together for me? All right, so let's see what these declarations are saying. Bit two, S equals zero. What does this mean? Bit 2s, what does that mean? S is two bits wide. Now, system is very smart. The moment it knows that, it knows that that zero, you're just being lazy. You really went to write two one-bit zeros. So it's making your life easier. You know, it's smart enough to actually expand the constants to the right size. Yep. If you specified what? So right now, no problem, we can do it. Let's see when the problem will arise. In this, you could have written S is three bits. Oh, yeah, I, mean, like, I know that the one straight to adder, but like, it's invalid. Well, until now, we have done nothing invalid, right? We've just declared that it's three bits. Let's see where we'll get into trouble with that. Okay. So if you assign three, it will assign the binary number one, one to S. So S has two wires. Initially, each S wire is zero. That's what it's saying, essentially. You know, so you, are, you know the size of it. The right hand side is somehow giving you the right constant for it. And now, based on that, we say, okay, each wire is wire to zero. And I'm saying the zeroth wire of C is also wire to zero. Okay. What did I do now? I said, let's instantiate our first full adder. So what I'm feeding to it is X0, Y0, and C0. And return something, C0. You know, CS, S0 can be gotten by looking at CS0, exactly what we were doing before. So this is a two-bit quantity, so the zeroth bit is the zeroth sum, and this is the carry bit that I want to plug in into the next place. So now the zeroth wire has been updated. 
you know, in this, because you are saying, initially you had said zeroth wire is wired to zero. Now you are saying actually the zeroth wire is wired to the output of CS0, whatever comes out of it, whatever comes out of the zeroth bit of CS0. All right, now we can instantiate the second full adder, and we are taking X1, Y1, and C1. Where did C1 come from? It came from the first full adder. Right? That's what we showed here, that you know, C1 came out of this, and that is going in here, and now it's producing CS1, so you have the zeroth bit, which is gonna give you the first sum bit, and you have the one here, which is gonna give you the carry bit from it. <clears throat> S1 is updated. Return C2, comma, S, so S was two bits, and uh, C2 is the carry bit, that you're returning, and that's the end of the function. What is this code? What is this code doing for you? All the codes we'll write in combinational functions are ultimately just wiring diagrams, right? So we have two f of a boxes, and using all these indices, we have specified this wire connects to that, this wire connects to that, inputs connect to these places, and the outputs are S and uh, uh, C2 coming out of this. This idea you have to internalize, that this is, when, whenever we write combinational circuits, we are writing functions. We are writing functions which can be as big as you want, and believe me, you'll write very gigantic combinational functions by the time we get going on this, right? The kind of functions that you would never dream of drawing a picture for, right? Because they're just too irregular or just bizarre, right? So you will see that later on in the course. But the idea is very simple. It's just function composition all the time. Function composition. Okay, so this thing uh, sometimes confuses people that we are taking something, C, which was three bits, and now I'm updating it, so I'm saying C is three bits wide, each element is set to zero, when I write C zero equals zero, that means, this is what you have to remember, C zero has been assigned to the zeroth element of C, but the values of the rest of the elements is unaffected. You are only changing one bit of C. Similarly, each bit in a multi-bit word must have an initial value, otherwise the system will complain. Actually, system will complain only if you try to use it. System will, an attempt to use an uninitialized bits will raise a compiler warning. Again, safety for you, right? So if you, if you do it and you forgot to initialize something, it'll come back and say, something is not right here. Okay, so this is the next class of circuits which are extremely important, you know, uh, for us. So let's look at them. Selection, you have already seen the use of selection. And selections come in two forms. So one form is simply it's a constant. You are saying, you know, I have a four-bit quantity and I write X2. What does that mean? So I have four wires going in and I'm selecting the second one. And it's simply this. It's just a wire selection. There is zero hardware involved. There is no hardware in this selection. When it's a constant selection, you just say from this wire, from now on, I want to use it. Everybody gets that, right? You're just saying X2 represents the wire named X2 in this picture. And you can actually do this with ranges also. I could have written X2 colon one, means I want to select two bits from it. So that's like saying that concatenate X2 comma X1. You're taking two wires out of X. There were four wires in X, and you want to use these two particular wires. <clears throat> More interesting thing is this one. Yep. Uh, so you said X, um, like X2 colon 0, would it select X2 and X0, or would it select X2? No, X2, X1, X0. Okay. So this is a range. Whenever you use colon in the middle, okay. it's a range numbers. <clears throat> okay, but suppose I is a dynamic quantity. <coughs> I is not given to you, it's not known at compile time. Now you have to do some real work. You know, you have to build a circuit 
which actually, given the value of i, will pick the right value from it. And this, in hardware, is represented like this. We call them muxers, that you had four possible inputs, and depending upon the value of i, the value you want on the output of that is one of those four. If i is equal to 0, then I want x0. If i equals 2, then I want x2, and so on. The difference between the first case and the second case is I really do not know the value of i, so you know I have to do some work at runtime. I have to build a circuit which can dynamically select. So muxes are used all over hardware design, and let's see how do they work. So here is a two-way mux. Okay, a mux is a simple conditional expression. So in blue spec, you will, you can write it like this: If s is zero then it's A, else it's B. At this level, it's, you know, you could have written, for example, something like this in Python. You know, if A is, if S0, otherwise it's B. You remember this much, Python, right? Okay, good. Now the question is, what does it mean in terms of gates? That's the question that is of, the deepest interest to us. <clears throat> and that's what it means in terms of gates. So let's see if you can make head and sense, uh, some sense out of this. So it's saying that if S is zero, that means this quantity is one. In that case, you'll take A and this will be, this will represent the value of A over here. On the other hand, if S is one, then this will always be 0, and this will represent the value b. So only one of them, either this is going to be a, or it's going to be 0, or this is going to be b or 0, but both of them can't be a and b at the same time. One of them is always a 0, and then you take an or of it, and that's what we wanted. Depending upon the value of s, the output circuit should be either 0, or either it should be a, or it should be b. And you will see that pretty soon, you know, I will forget that these things are one bit wide. I mean, this circuit makes sense even if you say S is 32 bits. Then how will you think of this circuit? If S is 32 bits, uh, sorry, A is 32 bits and B is 32 bits, what will you do? How will you realize this in hardware? You just replicate this circuit 32 times, and the same S bit goes in everywhere. So this is another thing that always comes as a shock to people, you know, who are not used to hardware. Muxes take a lot of area. So when you design hardware, and if somebody is using 64-bit muxes all the time, you know, it's very easy to write in software. If S equals zero, then A, otherwise it's B. But if A is a 64-bit quantity, suddenly you have generated tons and tons of gates over there. So please be aware of it, that muxes take area, right? You, there will be lots of issues if you have lots of conditionals in your program. How about four-way mux? I can just write it as a case statement. Right, so I'm doing now two bits, because if it's four bits, I, you have to give me at least two bits for the selection. If the value is zero, then it's A. If it's one, then it's B, et cetera, et cetera. And you, I'm sure you can figure out how to connect these two-bit muxes, I mean, uh, uh, two-way muxes, to build this four-way mux. S0 is, is going to select between A and B and C and D, and then whatever you get, you will select based on S1 in that. Fairly straightforward circuit to do. You could have written the case statement in uh, Python, in uh, something like this. Okay, n-way mux can be implemented using n minus one two-way muxes. All I'm trying to suggest is, you know, we can go from gates to building a two-way mux. From two-way mux, we can build a four-way mux. We can build as big a mux as you want. 
just throw more hardware at it. You know, more and more circuits are needed to realize this. Okay, so another operation which is extremely common in hardware is shift operation. So let's see how shifts work. Just like selectors, if you are shifting by some fixed amount, say two, it's very easy. No hardware is involved. You just take these wires and connect them. You take A and you know, you're putting it out, and in the first two places you put a zero over there. No hardware is involved, you know, as long as it's a fixed size you know, uh, shift that you did. Rotates and arithmetic shifts are also equally cheap. So if I was doing a rotate, it's just a jumble of wires, you know, so A goes here, B goes there, C goes here. This is, a, you know, rotate by two. There is something else you will learn later, you know, which is called arithmetic shift and the notion of sine extension. But essentially, it takes the highest bit, A, and replicates that. So instead of zeros here, you are going to put whatever A was in every place. So this is, uh, you know, arithmetic shift. It's called, it's very useful for multiplying and dividing by uh, powers of two. <clears throat> okay. So now suppose I want to build a shifter which will shift by n, right? n is a dynamic quantity. I don't know how much I want to shift. I'll tell you, runtime. So can you build me a circuit? You say, man, I know my muxes. I can build you a shifter, right? How will you build it? <laughs> you know, you can build something that shifts zero, one, two, three, four, right? As many shifts as you want. You told me they're cheap, right? So I have all those shifters sitting over there, which are just wiring diagrams. No hardware, no gates are involved. And then now I have a gigantic mux. So I feed the value of n. If n is zero, I take the first set of wires. If n is i, then I take the ith set of wires coming out of this, etc. So where is all the circuitry going in this? How, how big is this mux? You have 64 possibilities, right? I mean, it's not 64. Depending upon how big your n is, you know, you have that many possibilities. So it can take a lot of how many two-way, one-bit muxes are needed to implement this structure. Anyone? Yep. <laughs> Any other opinions? <clears throat> Take many more than that, right? Because you have to see how many, you know, uh, muxes are being, because it's a, you know, you have 32 of them to start out with. Many more muxes are needed. Can we do better? Can we do better? Now, this requires understanding something about numbers, how to do this better. So let me just uh, remind you what's going to happen. My claim is that I can do this by just having log n shifters. Instead of having n shifters, I can get away by having log n shifters. And these shifters will be shifting by 1, 2, 4, 8, et cetera, powers of 2. OK. So for example, we can perform shift 3 by doing a shift 2 and a shift 1. We can perform shift 5 by doing a shift of size 4 and 1. How about this one? 21. Why am I writing like this? This is the binary representation of 21. Right? It has a 16-bit thing. I mean, uh, 16 cube, 4 cube, and 1 cube. And therefore, I need these three shifters in order to shift by 21. 32-bit numbers, a 5-bit n, can specify all needed shifts. So what has happened now is you're giving me n, and I'm going to actually look at the binary representation of n. 
So when I look at the binary representation of three, what does it look like? It looks like zero, 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 one, one. What does that tell me when I want to shift? This number is going to require a one shifter and a two shifter. And if I connect them properly, then it will shift by three. And all these examples are worked out. So 21 would have looked like this. So it's giving you a clue. It's saying, if it is one, shift by that amount. If it is zero, don't shift it by that much. And now you can actually uh, uh, cascade them in that manner, where uh, bit encoding n tells us which shifters are needed. If the value of ith least significant bit is one, then we need to shift by two to the i. So I need this mux structure, which will say whether to shift or not to shift. So it's a two-way mux. Because if that particular bit s is zero, then you will not shift. And if it is something, then you are going to do that fixed amount of shifting over there. So if s is zero, and I was trying to shift it by two, then if s is zero, then it remains a, b, c, d. Otherwise, you have two zeros followed by a and b in this. So this is the kind of code you can write. Instead of writing that picture, this is how you would express it in BSV. And now you have, you have to design your shifter like this. So you can see this will shift. I can keep cascading it in this manner, define log n muxes to perform a particular size shift. And you take your number by which you're trying to shift, s, and look at various bits in it. So s0 is the last bit in this, you know, which is shifting by 0. s1 is shifting by 2. I didn't show you the other bits. You know, if you had s2, it will be shifting by 4 bits, etc. OK, suppose s is, s1 is 0, is a 2-bit number, shift circuit, shifts the number s can be expressed by two nested this thing. And this is precisely the take home problem. This is what you have to write a program for. Just on paper and pencil, you don't have to run it, right? You have to, uh, uh, this, this is what is given at the back of this uh, thing. Just very, very simple exercise to see if you have understood how to wire these diagrams, because I'm giving you some black boxes in terms of muxes and conditionals. The next lecture is on binary arithmetic.